What's up everybody? I'm Adam. You're watching Model Aviator. This week we're doing a review on the new Tower Hobbies Cessna 400 1.1 meter. Recently Tower brought back a couple of old school foamy designs, the Beaver and Sea Wind. Those were a big hit. This one is a bit more modern in design and construction, so let's check it out and we'll start with the assembly. The manual is well written and provides a great description of the few steps to assembly. Not a difficult assembly. There is one thing that some of you may not be used to, but that's still pretty easy. Let's get into it. As you can see, the parts count's pretty low. They're going to start you with installing the horizontal stabilizer. This is where you put the stabilizer into the back of the fuselage. You need to prepare that area. So we sand it off a bit of that so that we get a good glue contact. We put just a little bit of medium CA there where you see it, and then we put just a bit of medium CA on the top of the horizontal itself, and then slid it into place. You want to make sure that's nice and squared up. Next, we're going to install our rudder into our vertical. It has CA hinges pre-installed. You'll slide those CA hinges into the provided slots in the vertical and bottom of the fuse. You want to make sure that you have a very tight gap, but that you have full movement of the rudder. You want to put the airplane on its side in an airplane stand, deflect the rudder, and put one or two drops of thin CA on each CA hinge. This is one of those cases where less is more, folks. You want to turn it over, do the same thing on the other side, and make sure that you have a Q-tip or paper towel ready to wipe any excess CA that you get on it away. Again, I can't stress enough, one or two small drops, less is more. Next, we installed the wing. All the wires come in a plastic bag. When you take those wires out, it will reveal an aileron and flat plug. The lights are already incorporated into that, so there's not a third plug for those. One thing you need to be aware of, the hole in the bottom of the fuse that you have to fit the wires through is very small. So I tape the side of the wires down onto the wing with clear scotch tape so that it gave me a more central focused grouping of wires to easier fit through that hole and it did make it much easier. It's a tongue and groove on the front with two wing bolts in the back. Next, you'll install the main gear. It is a complete assembly. You simply squeeze them together, slide them into the slot, let them go, and they lock into place on their own with no tools. The steps poke into the foam. There's an allotted spot for the steps on either side of the bottom of the fuse. A single drop of CA, press them into place, and you're good to go. Same thing with the antenna on top of the airplane. At this point, you'll plug everything into your receiver, bind it to your transmitter, and check to make sure everything is working properly, but do not install that receiver yet. At this point, you can go ahead and attach the clevises from the elevator and rudder push rods to the control horns on the elevator and rudder. And it was at this point when we started moving those surfaces around that we discovered this. So, as you saw there, there's way too much flex in the push rods for the elevator and the rotor. Normally, there are keepers inside the fuse that keep that from happening, but not in this case. That kind of flex, particularly under flight pressures, can make the airplane fly a bit inconsistent. So, we can't have that. We had to come up with a fix. Not very difficult. We used two pieces of 16th inch light ply two and a half inches by just a little under a quarter of an inch wide. And we glued them here with welder cement. And as you can see here, that rectified the issue. We're no longer getting big flex out of those push rods and the airplane flies fine. So at this point, now you can go ahead and mount your receiver. Here is where it goes behind the rudder and elevator servos. And that's the reason we told you to wait. That quick fix is easier to do and manage when the receiver is not in your way. Once you get the receiver mounted, go ahead and make sure all your control surfaces are centered and put in whatever kind of setup you're going to put into the airplane. And then the last step is to mount your propeller and your spinner. Worth noting, we shaved the sides of the spinner holes so that it was a little bit bigger and we could easier fit the spinner on without the propeller blades touching the sides of the spinner. Oftentimes, when propeller blades are contacting the spinner that way, that causes vibration and makes them make noise. You can quiet that down by just relieving the holes in the spinner a bit. 
The Cessna 400 has a 43.3 inch wingspan. It's 27.56 inches long. Our example weighs 1 pound, 11.4 ounces, ready to fly with a 1300 3 cell. It has a 30 amp ESC, a 1200 kV brushless outrunner motor, 6 9 grab sub micro servos, and is intended for use with 3S 1300 to 3S 2200 flight packs. The Cessna 400 is a park flyer sized airplane and it is within what the AMA suggests is a park flyer size weight, under 2 pounds. However, it is quick. So if you plan to really let this thing eat at full throttle a lot, you're going to need a good size park to do that. Obviously, a sanctioned flying club or Freya is more than enough room. It is sold by Tower Hobbies as a plug and play, which means you choose the radio protocol you'd like to use and install your receiver of choice yourself. Full range receiver is highly recommended given the speed. It is a five channel airplane out of the box. You have elevator rudder with a steerable nose wheel and that nose wheel is convenient and easy to adjust via a quick connect on the rudder servo. You have variable throttle, ailerons, and flaps. And the flaps are nice, they're slotted flaps. You have LED wing lights, landing and navigation, and given the price point, there is quite a bit of scale fidelity. It is a convenient top loader, and there's plenty of room in the battery bay for even the largest recommended pack. When it comes to setup, the manual is a great place to start and get you through to a successful maiden, and of course you can adjust from there to your personal preferences. All the pertinent information is there, center of gravity, control horn and surf arm, factory settings, rates and control throws, things like that. When it comes to being a plug and play, obviously how the airplane flies is going to be determined by whether or not you install a receiver that has a stabilizer. We fly Spectrum, so we installed an AR630, which is an AS3X and safe capable receiver. We put AS3X on a switch, so we either have AS3X or we don't have anything. We did not incorporate SAFE. That way we can fly the airplane both ways and report to you how it performs both with and without a stabilizer. Our full setup page is next. Worth noting, we are in the stock recommended clevis to control horn position, so we didn't make any mechanical changes. Check out this setup info page, pause it if you'd like to set yours up the way we did. That is the final setup after we flew the airplane and tuned it. That's not what the manual says. And then we get into the flying, you'll see that, and we'll meet you back here. We'll give you our final thoughts. Check it out. One thing we noticed, the key to getting a smooth takeoff with this airplane, given the gear geometry, is to use takeoff flaps. With full flaps deployed, it slows down well, but at the same time, you can tell you're not flying a Cub or a Timber. When you crank it up to full throttle, it has very good speed and climb rate. At over 150 watts per pound, 
with an airplane this size, that is really good power. It's not 3D airplane territory by any means, but it's still very good. There's plenty of aerobatic capability. It flies like a solid low-wing sport plane. There's plenty of capability and power for big air maneuvers and it's as comfortable inverted as it is right side up. We're doing a dirty stall, full flaps, and it drops the wing slightly. You just simply neutralize the controls and it will fly right out of it. Interestingly enough, with a clean 1G stall, it just mushes straight forward. It will knife edge a bit with the 1500, but you can't sustain it forever. It will sustain it much longer with the 1300 and a little bit more rearward CG. go. That's how you log two landings in one attempt and make them both suck. That one was a good bit better. This is an interesting airplane given the forward rake on the main gear and the overall gear geometry. It's not a wheelie rider. You can do smooth landings, but I wasn't able to ride the mains with this one. Here's a grass landing and takeoff for you. This is going to work out, but it's a little bit subjective. There's not a lot of prop clearance. This grass is very short and well manicured. If yours isn't, it may not work out the same for you.
overall, the Cessna 400 is a very solid performer, and I had a good time flying it. We did that just to show how fast you can get off the ground with this thing and what kind of initial climb reach you have. Pretty doggone impressive for a three cell power system, but it is a small plane, so that makes sense. Another quick takeoff, and the whole purpose of this very short flight is to see if I can get it into an accelerated stall with a tight turn. And keep pulling, turning really tight, and right there, it stalled the high wing and rolled it over the top. I'm going to do the same thing again, gradually pull, and I have to get to almost full deflection. Really, really tight turn before it will do it. But you can't get this airplane into an accelerated stall. You can get a lot of airplanes into an accelerated stall. That shouldn't happen to you by mistake. You have to mean it to pull that hard. If you aerodynamically stall this plane or any plane in this manner and it's a surprise to you, you need to work on flying smoother. Aerodynamic or accelerated stalls can happen at any speed. All it takes is an abrupt pull. So, don't do that. And there you have it. We're going to get to our thoughts and the flight characteristics of the airplane in just a moment, but I want to lead this final thought segment off by addressing the modification that we did right after the assembly to keep the elevator and rotor push rods from flexing so much. We're shooting this segment a day after we shot all the other shop segments. That afforded me the ability to get up this morning and I noticed that Michael Klein had posted a video of him flying this airplane, so I watched it. Airplane flew fine for Michael. Michael makes everything look good. If you haven't checked out his channel, you need to. Phenomenal pilot and a great guy. He made no mention of the push rods flexing and certainly didn't seem to have any adverse effect at first glance watching him fly the airplane, but I heard some of the things that he said and I saw what the airplane was doing, and I'll come back to that. So I watched another reviewer's video, and that reviewer also made no mention of the push rods flexing. And I want to point out, it's important that you understand, other reviewers not catching this, not a bad thing. That's not a bad reflection on them. Anybody that plugs the airplane up, puts the hatch on, and then visually looks at the control surfaces moving, they're not doing anything wrong. That is fine. The reason I caught this is I'm just super anal about precision. So I take a look at what is happening mechanically throughout the process. I take a look at the servo arm. I want to see what's happening there. I want to see what's happening at the control horn, and I want to watch the push rod function. I look at that because sometimes I notice that there's a mechanical advantage I can improve upon and take some of the workload off the servo, maybe make the airplane fly a little bit better. Not everybody does that, and it's not a bad thing if you don't. I want to make it clear, the adverse effect that I said that has on the way an airplane flies is absolutely true. It does, but it's very subtle, and you have to know what you're looking for in flight and what you're feeling for. And if you don't already know what's doing that, it could be something that is so subtle that you don't even notice. So again, not a bad reflection on the people that aren't mentioning it. I'm just anal. And that's why I caught it on the bench before I ever flew the airplane and fixed it before I ever flew the airplane. So I want to explain what's happening when those push rods flex. When they flex, that is taking throw away 
from the surfaces. The surfaces, even though the push rods are flexing, are moving. The rotor and elevator are moving. They're certainly moving enough to fly the airplane, do aerobatics. It's not unsafe to fly. You're not in danger of crashing because the push rods are flexing, but you are losing throw. For every amount that that push rod flexes, that's throw that's being taken away from the control surface. And the faster you go, the more flight pressure that you put on those surfaces, the more it's going to make that push rod flex and the more control throw that you're going to lose. That's why when I watched Michael's video and he made mention that he couldn't get a nice perfectly straight knife edge, it did okay, but it didn't do as well as he wanted it to. He also couldn't get it to pop top quite as good as he wanted. Elevator and rudder is key in both those maneuvers, and you have to enter both of them going pretty fast, so there's a lot of flight pressure. There's a very good chance that the reason the airplane didn't perform the way Michael wanted it to is because those push rods are flexing. So to sum this up, is this a modification that you have to do for the airplane to be safe to fly? No. Is it a modification that you have to do for the airplane to still fly well? No. However, if you want full throw, and consistent throw throughout the speed range of the airplane. If you want it to be as precise as it can be, it is a modification that I recommend. So now that we covered that, really a good airplane. Had a great time flying this. It's a solid performer. Makes a good bit of power on three cell. Very pleased with that. We flew it on 1300 three cells, 1500 three cells, and 2200 three cells. And I have to say my favorite pack is the lighter of the packs that gives you a little bit better slow flight performance. So the Spectrum 1300 is my favorite pack. Get about five minutes with that. Flies fine on the 2200. You just have to account for the weight. It won't slow down quite as well, but it will still slow down. You just got to be mindful of the weight. And depending upon your throttle management, you can get up to about 10 minutes on that pack if you're flying this thing scale. When it comes to flying it with stabilization versus without, it is sleek, it is quick, and it is stable. So without stabilization, the airplane does fine, but as you might expect with it, it did refine the tune a bit. The airplane was a bit more stable, a bit more predictable, and obviously in the wind, much better with it than without it. So to sum that up, do you have to have it? Absolutely not. Will it make it a more refined flyer with it if you know how to tune it? It absolutely will. When it comes to skill level, this is an intermediate skill level airplane. It's not a trainer. Could it be a second airplane to somebody that has mastered a trainer? Yes, if that person is very confident. If you're a more timid person that's still kind of surviving your trainer and you haven't mastered it, this might be better served as a third plane rather than a second. It looks good. You get a lot of airplane for your money. $179.99 is a great deal for an airplane that looks and flies the, like this and has the features that this airplane has. And that's kind of the point of the Tower Hobby series of foam scale airplanes like this, the Beaver and the Sea Wind. You get a really unique looking piece that flies very well. A little more entailed assembly, a little less features, but less money than an E-Flight, and that is the point of them. So for a budget scale foam civilian airplane, we think $179.99 is a solid deal for this plane, given the way it looks and performs. If you decide that you'd like to add one to your hangar, we'll put links in the description where you can do just that. When you go through those links, it supports our efforts, and Heidi and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. That's it for us. Take care of yourselves. Happy flying. We'll see you next week with something else cool with wings.